I don't know if most ministers get to have the unique experience that I do when I'm able to come to the pulpit here and share God's word with you all. And what I mean by that is I can get up here and have a conversation. I mean, I'm with friends, I'm with family, and and I love that. I mean, you know, we don't have all of us here this morning, but I just love the fact that I can get up and, and talk to you just as one of you. Um, not that most ministers think they're separate, um, but I think all ministers think that, uh, and I do, that we have a holy purpose, that we've been set apart to do certain things, and and I'm thankful that God has decided to make a teacher out of me, and uh, that's what I intend to do. I want to ask you this morning, if you've heard the phrase, you're set in your ways. Hmm. Set in your ways. It, is that usually a positive thing that's said about you when you're set in your ways? No. No. Well, what if you were accused of being set in your ways and you're righteous and you're consistent and you're trustworthy? Would that be all bad to be set in your ways like that? It wouldn't, would it? You know, the older I get, the more I realize I am set in my ways. And we don't like change. Okay. And let me tell you, change is okay and change is necessary as long as you stay consistent to what God says. When you use his word as a foundation or your source of truth. And when somebody asks you to change and it violates your righteousness, your holiness, being set in your ways and your devotion to God, you can stand firm and let that comment roll right off of you. Because it's not all bad to be set in your ways. Now, do we take that to extremes? Yes, we do. We take that to extremes in being set in our ways and unfortunately coming to conclusions of condemnation in others. Are they wrong? Yeah, probably. Is it our place to say so? Maybe. Depends on the circumstance. It depends on how the other person is going to receive what you're about to share with them. There's nothing ever wrong with speaking the truth. It's the approach. It's the attitude. It's the body language. It's the facial expressions. It's the tone. It's the look on your face. Do you share truth with loving kindness? The truth is always the truth. Regardless of whether this world tells us what's true for you is true for you and what's true for me is true for me. Truth is truth. Yes is yes. No is no. Black is black. White is white. Good is good. Evil is evil. That's how our God operates. Okay. But even us knowing that's how our good, uh, our God operates how many of you perceive God as a loving father? I do. Is he not patient? Is he not forgiving? When is he most proud of you? When you're set in your ways, being obedient to him. We have an excellent example again in the book of Daniel, of Daniel being set in his ways. We've seen examples already. But this is perhaps the most famous. We've heard this story in Sunday school. And it's had an impact on our lives. We've seen illustrations of Daniel in the lion's den. 
And usually those illustrations are of a young Daniel. Strong, fierce, brave Daniel. Guess what? At this point in the story, our Daniel is likely in his 90s. In his 90s. And still set in his ways. Unyielding. Unswerving. Let's just look at our text this morning. We'll kind of comment as we go. This is the last of the narrative section of Daniel where it's kind of like a a nice flowing story. We're going to be in prophecy next. It's a little more tedious. This, these, these last chapters have flown so easily, and it's hard for me to get long-winded about them. And I'll try not to with this one either. Okay, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon, 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. And over them, three high officials of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. I thought Daniel was already prime minister. <laughs> okay. You need to understand, Babylon does not exist anymore as a kingdom, as an empire. Okay, we, we had King Nebuchadnezzar, we had Belshazzar. They're gone. Belshazzar's dead. The Medes and the Persians have come in, they have sacked the city of Babylon, and Darius, the king of the Medes and the Persians, has taken over. And now he set up his governing system. It's going to be ruled by three, let's say governors, and 100 mayors. Okay, We've got a hierarchy, a, a chain of command here. And the king is pleased with Daniel. Why? Because an excellent spirit was in him. I'm sure many of you have been told you have pleasant personalities because you do the joy to be around full of grace and peace and love has anyone ever said to you they haven't to me wow, you have an excellent spirit in you no yeah. I know of a person like that and I hope she can stay like that as she grows older. Excellent spirit is something that comes natural. You know, it's like that inner beauty. Yeah, I'm talking about you, sis. And it, and it, and it breaks your heart when you see that spirit broken. Okay. But when the spirit is set, and Jesus says, you build your house on the rock. Okay. When you have that foundation, that spirit that people can see in you, they may hurt it, but they can't break it. All right. So, so Daniel has this quality in him, and it's obvious. It, it's like that beautiful soul, that person you know. All right. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. <laughs> so Daniel has an excellent spirit. The king sees this in him. He has favor from the king. What does that do when you and I have the attention and the appreciation of other people? Usually what happens is somebody gets jealous that they don't have it. Somebody gets jealous that things are going right for you and not for them. So what do you do? Tear them down. We're going to tear them down. Why? Lower you, elevate me. 
All right. It, it's the same old plan that we have in our hearts that has existed for from the beginning. The way to make ourselves better is to put others down. But they could find no complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found to him. This guy does everything right. He, he's just. He's merciful. He's full of grace. He has an excellent spirit. We can't find anything wrong with him. We can't accuse him of anything before the king. He does everything the king says excellently. And then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this, Daniel, unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Because we know where Daniel will not cave. We know the limits of Daniel. We know that when push comes to shove, he is going to be obedient to God. So let's find a contradiction between our earthly or kingly rule and the rule of God. That's nothing new either. Remember what Satan said to Eve? Surely you won't die. Surely God didn't mean that. You, you misunderstood God. He didn't come right out and say, God's full of hooey or, you know, who cares what God said? No, very subtle. God didn't mean that. It's okay. <laughs> Look at it. It's, it's pleasing to the eye. You know it'll taste good. God doesn't want you to be like him. He wants all that for himself. He's holding out on you. You deserve to be your own God. That's the pitch the world's selling you and I. You deserve to be your own God. So, they come up with an excellent plan against a righteous Daniel. We'll use his obedience to God against him. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, Oh, King Darius, live forever. Got to give the accolades to the king, right? And look, it said, These high officials and satraps came by agreement. Um, there was one official I'm sure was not in on this, and his name's Daniel. <laughs> they, they did this behind Daniel's back which is usually how it works. When somebody's jealous of you and they want to tear you down, well, hi, honey. Well, hello, good friend. No good, SOB. <coughs> Friendly to your face, stab you in the back. And all the officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors, the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes a petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so it cannot be changed according to the law of the Peds and the Peds, the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. I kind of like the Peds and the Persians, don't you? <laughs> Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. Here's what they said. O oh, king, we want you to be God for 30 days. You're awesome, king. We want to make you God. And of course, the king's like, I will accept being your God for 30 days. I humbly and graciously accept your endorsement to be God for 30 days. Anybody that gets this kind of a... What do all of our politicians like? Politicians saying, you're the man, you're the woman, we're with you, we're with you. Look, our political system's not all that great, I don't think. 
you got two sides. They're always going to be at odds. Always. Will three sides fix that? I don't think so. One side. Until our political leaders do like Nebuchadnezzar and say, the most high God rules over men. We're going to be in the mess we're in until Jesus comes. That's just how it is. But King Darius obviously was flattered and signed the document injunction. Now, Daniel got wind of this. When Daniel knew that the document had, signed, had been signed, he went to his house and he hid in the closet. That's not what it says. He went to his house where he had his windows and his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. Just like all the other times he went to his house, his windows were open facing Jerusalem. Nothing's changed. He got down on his knees three times a day like he always had done. And he prayed and gave thanks before his God like he had done day in, day out. Nothing has changed in Daniel. As he had done previously, it says. So you can imagine the satraps, the governing officials, all the governors, they're hiding around the corner down the street and looking to see if Daniel's got his window open. Oh, he's praying! We got him! Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. When people want you to fail, they'll find you failing. They just will. You may be failing by their standard, but not necessarily by God's standard. But if they want to find fault in you, they will. Not if you hide in the closet, but if you keep being the consistent Christian, the consistent follower of Christ, they'll find fault with you. Did they not crucify our Lord? Was there any fault in him? There was not. They'll find fault with you. They found fault with Jesus for the same reasons they're finding fault with Daniel. He's a blasphemer. He doesn't, he doesn't give tribute to Caesar. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king! Did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to God or, or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? King, did you just not sign this order? You did, didn't you? And the king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Peds and the Mersians, which cannot be revoked. I like that much better. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you've signed, but makes his petition three times a day. You know, the Jews have always been hated in every generation, even today. So many groups hate God's people. And I want you to understand very clearly from this preacher's mouth, I believe the Jews are God's people because the Bible said so. Now, many of them have not recognized our Messiah yet, but it doesn't mean they won't. And it doesn't mean they aren't God's chosen people. We're the ones who are grafted in. Let's always keep that in mind. As Christians, our Lord was a Jew. He's still a Jew from the, from the tribe of Judah. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. What this means is the king said, how could I be so stupid to fall into this trap and be duped. He loves Daniel. 
He respects Daniel. Daniel is his guy. He has seen an excellent spirit in Daniel. He just got trapped in his own stupid ego and lawmaking. He was clouded by his own pride and overlooked his faithful servant. I think that's what can happen to us sometimes. When we're having huge success in whatever avenue we're involved in. When we're having huge success, all of a sudden, what happens to us? We become complacent. Complacency leads to self-reliance. It's all, it's all a pride problem. Okay, We always need to remember that what we've been given is from God, that what we have is from where we have come from. I mean, how many of you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth? Even those born with a silver spoon in their mouth had to be cleaned off and had a diaper put on them. They couldn't do it themselves. They had to be fed. They had to be burped. They had to be changed. And, and when they die, they get to take none of it with We're, we're all the same. Let's not let our success cloud our good judgment. That's what I'm trying to say, I guess. That's what happened to the king. So he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. And what this means is the king that whole day spent time in the laws trying to find a loophole to get Daniel out of the mess that the king had created himself. I mean, th this verse, the distress set his mind deliver Daniel to labor all day to rescue him. This tells you how much the king cares about Daniel. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Now, O king, that is a law of the Peds and the Mersians that no injunction or ordinance that the king established can be changed. End of the day, they came and said, you got to do it. By your own law, you have to do it. The king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. What did the king recognize in Daniel? Consistent service, dedication, loyalty. Excellent spirit. Now, the den of lions, forget about the pictures you've seen as a child and the illustrations that we have in our mind. It's likely the side of a hill that's been dug out from the side and a hole in the top of the hill. It's a pit. Okay. They baited the, they've got a cage inside. They bait the lions in the cage with food. They drop the door behind the cage. The top of the hole where they cast the person down in is right over the cage. And what they do is they starve the lions so that when they drop in whoever, they're ready to eat. Now, so many of the critics of this book want to poke holes in this chapter, of course, and say, oh, well, there are only two lions, and Daniel got away. He hid in the corner. Or the lions had been fed, and they weren't hungry, or blah, blah, blah. Just stupid rhetoric. And we shouldn't pay any attention to that. These lions are hungry. There's a bunch of them, and I'll, I'll prove that in a minute. Well, I'll prove they're hungry and that there are a bunch of them in just a minute. And a stone was brought and laid at the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. So he's in there all night. If you break the seal, you break the king's law, the king's order. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. No diversions were brought to him. There was no music. There were no concubines. There was no food. Nothing to distract the king. His mind was on Daniel, period, all night. He couldn't sleep. He was a wreck. 
Then at the break of day, the king arose and he went in haste to the den of the lions. The man ran down to check on Daniel. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, Oh, Daniel, servant of the living God. How did he know that title? How did he know the title servant of the living God? Living God is a special designation. The God who is everlasting. Unending. I'm telling you, Daniel has had the same effect on this king that he had on Nebuchadnezzar. And the Chaldeans hated the Jews like the Nazis hated the Jews. And Daniel's a Jew. Oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you, deliver you from the king, from the lions. Sorry. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. Now, I don't know if that's appropriate when lions are surrounding you, but evidently you always want to praise the king before you say anything else. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. So not only did I not betray my God, I didn't betray you. I just stayed faithful to everything that I was already doing. <laughs> the king was excitingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. All right. Here's where the lions are hungry and there's a bunch of them. And those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children, and their wives. You remember how many satraps there were? A hundred. Three officials. Okay, so let's just say bare minimum, 103. Bare minimum, they all had wives. I guarantee you, at least one. So there's 206. They probably all had a child. There's 303, or 309, sorry, math. Not my thing. Leave that to Claire. That's a lot of people. And before they reached the bottom of the den... The lions overpowered them and broke their bones into pieces. The King James indicated they never hit the ground. A lot of lions, a lot of hungry lions. Now, I don't think they were satisfied with hunger 24 hours prior to you. Do you think their hunger was satisfied and they just left Daniel alone? I think they were already, already hungry. They broke their bones into pieces. And then Daniel has the same effect on Darius that he had on Nebuchadnezzar. He wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Forget about Belial. Forget about all the gods of iron and silver and bronze. We are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Today we call that reverence. Tremble and fear, we call it's reverence. That's what we're to do. Not in the sense of being scared, but in the sense of showing awe and respect. Because we know if we don't, well, we don't want to know if we don't. That's why we're in reverence. Okay? But listen to this decree. The God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. 
He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who he has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. Long story short, King Darius says, My eyes have seen it. Give glory to God. Daniel's God. Christians, brothers and sisters this morning, our eyes have seen it. Give glory to God. How many of you have seen a life miraculously changed because of a relationship with Jesus Christ? All of us have. It may be your life. I mean, I wasn't in the proverbial gutter, but I was in the gutter, spiritually speaking, a long time ago. You know, and even today, I can find myself not in the gutter, but maybe in a rut. We'll have those times in our lives. But the important thing is, be set in your ways. Be set in your righteous ways. Nothing wrong with it. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Cyrus isn't necessarily any more important than Darius. But it was prophesied that a king named Cyrus would return the exiles to Jerusalem. And that's what will happen. Now, do you think the fact that the Jews get to go home later on, do you think this had anything to do with Daniel's relationship with Darius and Cyrus? I do. I do. Look, you may never be the president of whatever, your home, your place of work, your office. You may never be the president, but you can be the prime minister. You can be the chief executive officer. You can be the one who has the ear of the one who makes the decisions, and you can affect the outcome of what happens in your circles just by being set in your righteous ways. It's hard, especially in this woke culture, trying to be politically correct and saying all the right things. I can't even keep track of it all anymore. Claire and Chloe helped me with that, but I still am terrible. Am I asking you to be tolerant? No. I'm asking you to be kind and loving. The people who are living woke and being politically correct, Jesus loves them too. And he commands us to show them love. Even if it ticks us off. Even if if we want to yell them down. You'll never win anybody over yelling them down. Won't happen. Show them kindness, show them love, grace, and mercy, because that's what God has shown you. And then you might have an opportunity. But hey, be the be God's man in your circle. Be God's woman in your circle. Lead the prayer. Show reverence. Be consistent. I guess I'm trying to say be Christ-like. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's such an excellent example from the book of Daniel. We've had so many in this study. Father, even though this all happened so long ago, we can see that things haven't changed when it comes to people. People go behind our backs. People find reasons to accuse us. And not that we're without fault, but we can't escape fault. We, we, we are people that have sin issues, plain and simple. So help us, Father, work on our consistency. That if we are to be tried for any sort of guilt, that we might be found blameless. Before men, but especially before you. Father, that's our goal. I, I I know that's why we need the blood of Christ, because we can never get there. And his perfect 
atoning, precious, pure blood uh, makes propitiation for us. It, it takes the place of our blood. And Father, Jesus, we know, deserved none of it. But he was willing to embrace the cross on our behalf. And he was perfect. Father, it's so hard some days to be consistent and to strive for perfection when taking the easy way out feels so much more secure and so better to our flesh. Sometimes we've got to make hard decisions, Father. Sometimes we have to stop worrying about pleasing people and worry about pleasing you. That's difficult, especially when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances. We want people to like us. We want people to appreciate us. That's part of our pride issue, Father, and I don't know that we'll ever get past that. It's part of our sinful nature, but I pray that when we're feeling really good about ourselves, that we somehow shift the attention to you. That'll help with a lot of things. It'll help with our pride issue. That will help with the direction that people are looking. I would much rather them look at you than look at me. Father, thank you again for these saints that are here this morning. I just want to ask a blessing on their lives, their homes. Father, keep them safe. Protect them from evil. And Father, help them to be a dangerous force in this world against the army of Satan as he surrounds us on a daily basis. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah.